Wow. Am I in heaven? No, my son. You are in the cloud. The cloud? Wait, you mean like where I store all my pictures and videos? Yes. You know, not everything needs to go in the cloud. By the way, your password? Way too easy to break. I don't want to be in the cloud anymore. Back in the day, we used computer hard drives, CDs, and even floppy disks to store our data. Nowadays, however, we have the cloud. Woo! The future. But what is the cloud? Or more importantly, where does all of our stuff go? Cloud storage is essentially a virtual locker where you can remotely stash any of your data. So are all of those cat photos just hanging around up in the sky? Mm, not quite. When you upload a file to a cloud-based service like Google Drive or iCloud, that file gets copied over the internet into a data server. Database servers are actual physical places where companies store your files on multiple hard drives. Most companies will have hundreds of these servers, known as server farms, spanning across multiple locations. So if one happens to get hit by an asteroid, you won't lose your data because it'll be backed up at another location. This is referred to as redundancy, and it keeps your data safe from being lost. Chances are you're already utilizing cloud computing if you use services like Gmail, which connects to Google Drive. Storage on Google Drive starts you at 15 gigabytes for free, but can be increased to as high as 30 terabytes for $300 a month. Services like iCloud, Dropbox, and Microsoft OneDrive offer similar monthly fees for higher storage capabilities. One huge benefit of cloud computing is that you can access data on any internet-capable device. And these days, what isn't connected to the internet? Mark Twain once said you could put all of your eggs in one basket, you just had to keep an eye on that basket. It's important to note that Mark Twain never worked in IT. Today's topic is RAID, which stands for Redundant Array of Independent Disks, or if you're old school, inexpensive disks. So imagine that this bag of eggs is a file, say a Word document, and the individual eggs represent the packets of data that make up the file. Saving directly to a physical drive would look something like this, placing all of those eggs, one after another, directly into a single basket. But what if you ran out of room in your basket? Or worse yet, what if something happened to the basket? This is where RAID comes in. RAID allows you to take a collection of disks and configure them in such a way that your computer recognizes them as one logical disk unit. So why do this? Well, perhaps the most important reason is redundancy. And if redundancy is a big priority, RAID 1 is a great place to start. See, with RAID 1, you mirror your drives, which means that anything that you save on one drive, you save on another just like it. So if you end up having a drive failure, you've got a spare. However, there are some downsides. First, you're having to write to two drives now, which can make things a little bit slower. But even worse, we're now using a total of two terabytes of available storage for only one usable terabyte. So sure, with RAID 1, you aren't putting all of your eggs in one basket, but you are always carrying twice as many baskets as you're using. So what if you decided, I don't care about redundancy. I want speed and efficient use of drive space. This is where RAID 0 comes in. See, RAID 0 stripes data across multiple drives. Basically what this means is that data is being saved bit by bit across drives which, again, act as one. Because much of this data is written almost simultaneously, RAID 0 can provide faster write speeds. However, it's called RAID 0 for a reason. See, 
RAID 0 provides no redundancy whatsoever, so while you're not putting all of your eggs in one basket, you may as well be, because if you lose one drive, you no longer have the full data set, and this means our Word document is now gone forever. Fortunately, there are a few other options available if you'd like to have more usable drive space, but would still like to keep data safe from a drive failure. And this is where RAID 5 comes in. So first, with RAID 5, you'll need at least three drives. Data is striped across drives like in RAID 0, but now packets of parity data are created by calculating a combination of the other bits of data being stored. This continues with these packets of parity data being placed in different drives sequentially as the data is saved. Now what's cool about RAID 5 is that if any one drive fails, you can still recreate all of your data using the parity data. So now, you're making better use of available disk space and you have redundancy in case of a drive failure. So what's the catch? Well, because writing these parity bits takes some calculation, you're adding complexity, which means, in case of a drive failure, some additional recovery time. So at this point, we've covered reliable RAID 1, speedy RAID 0, and well-rounded but complex RAID 5. There are other RAID levels, but we won't cover those here as they're much less common. However, it is useful to know that the RAID levels we've discussed can be nested to create new RAID solutions. Remember how we said RAID uses an array of drives to create a single logical drive? Well, once you have these logical drives, you can use them in a new RAID configuration, like in RAID 1 plus 0, or as it's commonly known, RAID 10. Let's start by taking two physical drives to create a single logical drive using RAID 1, and now another logical RAID 1 drive. Now that we have two logical drives, we can again use RAID to create an array. In the case of RAID 10, we'd use RAID 0. So now we have the speed of RAID 0 supported by the reliability of mirrored data using RAID 1. So as you can see, regardless of your needs, RAID provides a storage solution to keep all of your eggs safe and sound. Please consult the